I actually don't think there are many Web3 companies that are, like Web3 isn't popular yet because everyone is trying to take this like very Web3 approach that Web2 users don't understand. For example, like in the creator economy, a lot of people are doing social tokens and like you can buy your favorite creator's tokens and stake them, et cetera. And like people are like, I don't understand what that means. Right. Thank you for coming out and uh, and being with us today. Really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for having me. You've had a pretty cool entrepreneurial journey in uh, in not a lot of time. It's 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 pretty impressive. Would you kind of just give us the genesis? I know you interned at Facebook, and then you were the first female designer at Snap, right? Yeah. And and a lot of other cool things, but just to kind of give us a. Uh, you know, the, the overview of the entrepreneurial journey to date. Yeah, definitely. So I was always an entrepreneur growing up, I believe. Like in kindergarten, I was selling Pokemon cards and colored pencils for money. I actually got sent to the principal's office and got threatened to like, you know, get kicked out of And you're like, I'm selling Pokemon cards. Yeah, weed. exactly. <laughs> and then um, in around second grade, I started learning to code. So I was making bots, using these bots to get rare items and Neopets on like the actual site and then reselling them on forums um, for like thousands of dollars. So I figured out how to make a PayPal account via like a Visa debit card and you didn't really have to verify anything back then so I didn't have a bank account but I had like money sitting on PayPal which I could use to spend on sites like eBay and then just started making a bunch of like internet marketing tools made one of the first Twitter bots out there that would just like auto follow and unfollow people and targeted internet marketers who would spend quite a lot of money on it yeah I got into hackathons in college and that's when I discovered the startup world and that there were things that were even bigger than these like mini websites I was creating started diving into that and then decided to drop out of college and pursue my like bigger entrepreneurship journey. In terms of going to Facebook, what was that like and what were you doing there in the end? Yeah, so I was doing iOS engineering and worked on Messenger and then afterwards I decided I wanted to start my own company so I'd actually got the Teal Fellowship and the deal was that like I could do the Teal Fellowship if I left Facebook. It was called 20 under 20 back then and Peter Teal was giving kids $100,000 to drop out of school and pursue their dreams because he wanted to make a point that you didn't need college. How do you feel about that? Are you happy with that, that choice? You've done okay? Yeah, I'm very happy with that yeah. choice. I actually think everyone that pursued the Teal Fellowship ended up doing incredibly well, and I think it's because they got a head start in life. Like, they entered Silicon Valley when they are like, 18, 19 years old, were able to network with other, like, incredibly smart people, and realistically, they just got, like, a three-year head start with tons of resources. So, and you self-educated on coding, or did you go through courses or training, or? Yeah, so I self-educated myself when I was younger, but I did study computer science um, at Carnegie Mellon. How important do you think it is to code these days? I think the future is actually no code, personally. Yeah? Uh, there's a lot of no code tools out there right now. You can use Airtable, like, et cetera, to Bubble. just hack things together. And you're even seeing, like, design software where you can press a button, and it'll, like, essentially code the site for you. That being said, I think that, like, knowing how to code is important or like understanding the fundamentals because like realistically like the best sites today and the best apps today like you still need a team of engineers and you will know like how much you should be spending on creating an app what the actual time frame should be etc if you know how to code like if you are just a business person and you are hiring a team of engineers you're gonna get ripped off yeah <laughs> yeah how, so how do you do that if I mean you partner with a coder I guess what, what's yeah. how does the person who wants to go and, do, and develop some software app or something like that. Build a team without getting ripped off. If you wanted to actually learn how to code, there's a lot of online resources that are free out there. I think App Academy is like one of the best yeah. out there if you wanted to like actually dive into coding yourself. Otherwise, I would highly recommend finding someone technical to partner up with. Students from MIT will gladly do it. <laughs> yeah. And you, um, I think, was it at, uh, at Quora that you met your partner for Scale? Yes. Would you tell us a little bit about that story and then how that yeah, partnership came sure. to be? We were just both young dropouts, essentially. Well, he hadn't dropped out or gone to You college got paid yet. to drop out, so that's okay. Yeah, I got ready to drop out. He was a tech lead there, and we were just like, okay, we're the youngest people at this company. We're, like, crushing it. We would just have lunch together every single day, and we were like, yeah, let's start a company together one day. And then I was at Snap, and uh, I was just getting bored working on projects on the side every weekend, so I hit him up. And now I'm like, okay, now I want to do a company. Why Combinator applications are coming up. We should just do it. So we were just coding random things like during like winter break or something <laughs> and then applied to YC. And we applied with like several different ideas, but which neither of, we didn't work on any of the ideas we actually applied with, but they ended up accepting us because of our like history. 
So it went so scale uh, AI went through Y Combinator. Yes. What do you, what did you think of that? Well, actually, first, would you tell everybody just in case they don't know what is Y Combinator? Yeah. And then why did you choose that route, and where you, would you do it again? Yeah. So Y Combinator is probably the best accelerator program in the world. Like Twitch came out of it, Dropbox came out of it, et cetera. Like they created several unicorns. I enjoyed the experience. I think that like if you're a B two B company, it gives you an unfair advantage because it's just like you can sell to all the other YC companies. Right. And it's just like ongoing infinite network of companies that have funding that can spend on your product. So if you are a B2B company that has a product that's useful for any company out there, like it's a no brainer to do. Would I do it again? The answer is actually no on my end because it's a lot of dilution. Like they take a large percentage. What is the percentage they take? I think it's new now. It used to be 1.20 for 7%. Okay. Uh, they have a new deal where they invest 500K, but like a portion of it is on an uncapped note, okay. which is good and bad in a lot of ways. Like technically you get more of the money for less dilution, but they're doing that because they want to squeeze into your next round and get more ownership. Yeah. 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 How did um, how did the partnership come about uh, for scale and then uh, and and evolve? Yeah, so uh, I like we just decided to be co-founders and then started. We got into YC and then I ended up raising some money in Los Angeles too from this guy Paige Craig. He coined the term Silicon Beach, and then we just started building. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, when you're talking about going into business like that, a lot of people I think have challenges with. Well, how do we know who gets what percentage and work that out? Uh, and, yeah. and then how do we work together? I mean, we were both so early. We were both technical. We were very complimentary. So it was just very 50-50. And I'd actually highly suggest it be 50-50 for anyone that's just starting out. I think the only exception is if you've already raised money, right? Like if you've already raised money and then you bring on someone, then it's absolutely fair to give them a lower percentage. And it's just like what capacity they are um, joining you in. Like if you're adding them as a co-founder post fundraising, what's typical is 10% or like a CTO, et cetera. If you're hiring like an engineer, I would say be equity generous. Give them like one through 5% for your first engineer, depending on how much you've raised. Is that typically done through options? Do you find that's kind of the best way? Or Yeah. Yeah? Okay. And you've done a lot of fundraising. You, you had written an article on it and it couldn't pull it up, which has got me totally hanging because it was yeah. like, I wrote this long thing on exactly how you do fundraising. Would you share with us? How, how would you go about doing that? if you didn't have any connections right now? We just created major FOMO. Um, what I did was I looked at friends who knew investors and asked them to send the investor, like like hype me up essentially, right? I say like, you have to meet Lucy, blah, blah, um, or I'll send a forwardable to them and then they forward it to the investor and then we get introed. But like once it's hyped up, um, I align all the meetings all at once. Start off with like the investors that I care less about that I view as like a practice round because like they're gonna ask questions and then I can like reform my pitch and then have all the like bigger investors that can write larger checks in the end. And then um, kind of just say like, oh yeah, like I'm really busy because I actually have like all these other meetings or I'm going to be <laughs> on Sand Hill Road these dates. So like it's best to meet at this time. And then like suddenly they know that you're talking to other investors without you saying who exactly you're talking to, which you don't actually want to reveal because they will back channel. So if you're like, oh, I'm talking to like this person at Sequoia don't and then they that. end up past, they ch like it will cause other investors to pass. Versus like if you leave it like up hanging, like everyone's gonna try to figure it out, but that creates insane FOMO and like there's not one person they go to where like if they end up passing on you, like they know. So when you have the conversations with the investors, how do you prep for that? What do you do to get ready for that conversation? Including, do you show them a deck? Do yeah. you show them a demo, a wireframe? What, what what do you do? Yeah, so in general, I like to send the materials beforehand. I think that having a naturally flowing conversation is much better because you want to get the investors talking because once they're talking more than you, they are already convinced and they're convincing themselves to invest. Versus like if you walk through a deck during an investor meeting, like you're doing most of the talking and they're probably falling asleep. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So you ask them questions or like how do you get them talking more? Honestly, like I just let them talk and I don't interrupt until there's silence. Okay. And then I'll follow up with maybe a question or a point I know that they'll like based off what they said. Okay. Yeah. Now, so there's all these different structures for raising money too. You could sell direct equity, you can do a safe, you can do convertible notes. Do you have one of those things that you think works better than the other? or that? Yeah, I think safes are the best way to go for your first round of funding because it's cheap. Uh, you don't really need to use lawyers because the YC safe is just so standard and it's fast, right? 
Would you give everybody just an outline of what a safe is and kind of how that works? And so not, safe not is legally, like a obviously promise for future equity, essentially, when the round converts into a priced round. And then when you're doing those pitches, do you already have your team together or do you try to raise money so that you have enough to attract a team to say that I'm funded now, so don't worry, you can come over here and... I always think it's really sketchy when someone puts together like a deck of their team when their team isn't actually full-time or hired. Right. I think that's a really big red flag for investors. Whenever I've raised, I've just been like, hey, I'm a solo founder or hey, I have a co-founder. Okay. Yeah. And when you're talking to people who are going to be on the team, what kinds of questions do you think is really good to ask to be sure that you're getting the right people? Uh, in general, I think I want to see what their work ethic is like. like. Obviously, if I'm like interviewing an engineer, I'll give them engineering questions. If I'm interviewing a marketer, I figure out like just how good they are. I'll do like reference checks with 10 other people. That being said, I don't look for like all perfect reference checks because I do think that like a lot of people are just very polarizing. So I see like, are there at least some good reference checks? But I try to like evaluate their skill set and like whether they're willing to grind the first like two years, let's say, because I think work life balance is incredibly difficult to have your first like two years while you're trying to like build up the company. <laughs> yeah. And as far as finding those people, do you like search firms? What do you think about using a like a professional search firm or recruiter? I do not because I generally think the best talent the second they like even mention they're going to quit, they already have like 10 companies on them, right? right? So they're not going to have to even need to use a search firm. So the best people you're going to get are like you convince them to drop out of college. You like convince them to quit their job where they're already excelling at. How do you find those people if you're sitting out here and don't know how to find those people? One way I found those people was I figured out like every single student at like Stanford, MIT, et cetera, back in the day when Facebook was popular. And then I added their email to like my Facebook account so I can access these like student groups. And I would just post job listings in colleges that I didn't go to. I've done a lot of like technical interviewing and, and I just knew like which colleges I thought had the best engineers. <laughs> so nice. I like targeted those colleges. But I would say like really infiltrating student groups and infiltrating like great companies. Okay. So I would like go to lunch at certain companies like Stripe, et cetera, and like just make friends with every single person and kind of figure out from there who is like there for four years, et cetera, thinking about leaving. Um, if you really wanted to go cold, you can go on LinkedIn and like look at who's been four years at a certain company or three years even because they're about to like their golden handcuffs are almost gone because almost every company has like a standard one year cliff for your best. You also have gotten into venture investing yourself through yes. back-end capital. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came about and how it works? Yeah, so it came about because I was just like, okay, I've done everything from like founding the company, product, engineering, et cetera. I want to try venture, right? Yeah. Also, my like lead investor, um, Excel for Series A, was like, hey, like we want to just give you some money to like play around and do venture with, and like you'll get the carry, et cetera. So I did that, and I was doing a really good job. Nice. So uh, I ended up just raising a fund and then investing in an early stage company. So I focused on pre seed and seed. I was like, because that's my specialty. Like I like betting on people versus traction because sometimes there's traction but like there's an upper limit like tam right how do you vet the investments that it's gonna yeah be? so uh, my thesis was invest in technical people because if you have a team of like let's say an engineer and a designer they never need to hire a single person they have like indefinite runway to continuously pivot so as long as they persevere and never give up they will probably figure out something like i have a very good friend who i met in the teal fellowship back in 2014 and he's been pivoting and finally raised a giant round like this month yeah. <laughs> um, and like finally figured it out because he never gave up because he was technically like he could just live off ramen for the rest of his life. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. For the fund, do you like some of the tools like AngelList provides for Pete for fun so that yeah. all the back end is taken care of? Or do you think it's better to have your own team? Or, or what, what are your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so I've done both. Like fun one, I used AngelList and fun two, I had my own team. I would do AngelList again. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a lot of work. Yeah, right? it's easy. Yeah. yeah. And um, and then as far as peak picking, d did you have someone to kind of do the ops for the fund or are you tr doing everything? Back when we were on AngelList, I was just doing everything because AngelList was essentially the ops. And then for fun too, we hired someone to help out with some of the ops. Okay. What are some of the companies you've invested in? With back end. Is, and is, yeah. it, is that fund still open? It's still open. Oh, it's not open like you can't invest in it anymore, okay. but like we are still doubling down on current investments. Okay. So Ramp is probably our like big winner, like a multiple billions, maybe seven, eight billion the last round. And um, we invested in paid. I mean, Ramp is a credit card for companies essentially. So it helps you save money and figures out like where you can save. And then we invested in PAVE, which is like compensation, transparency. So you know how much to pay others. That is also um, like a unicorn right now. How much to pay others? So yeah. So 
like it's like okay so like you're an engineer right like you're a series b company hiring an engineer of this status like how much are other companies offering like okay. similar profiles okay main street which finds you savings on companies which is awesome yeah just a bunch of random companies we invested in crossmint at a great valuation this is actually a company that we like essentially incubated because we started our own thing similar to y combinator except like our thing was we provide housing we give you less money but we take less equity they just raised at a 70 million dollar valuation i believe it's like a moon pay competitor on solana if somebody wants to get into investing whether it's through funds or, or trying to get into those rounds what, what do you think is the best route for them so if you know people obviously a fund is less risk and you get management fees so let's say you raise like a billion dollar fund you're getting like 20 percent of management fees essentially so that's like 200 million for you to manage the fund but also pay yourself right that's a lot of money i personally think that if you're well connected spvs make the most sense so you find out a company in like a series d that might ipo soon so you have like a shorter time frame on liquidity you get a large allocation because they're already raising like let's say tens of millions or hundreds of millions so it's not hard to get like a one to two million dollar allocation and then you run an spv on it you charge management fees and carry on it and you can run through like as many of these as you want that's great yeah. what are some of the best companies you think that present opportunities to invest in right now not uh, specific companies but like categorically categories i would say like ai is super hot and web3 is still super hot okay and yeah. what does web3 mean to you like because it's you hear that thrown around a whole lot yeah i think it's decentralization and just like ownership of your fans um i think it's cutting out the middlemen because like for example like credit card processors right like they can charge a lot of money and if you can cut that out then suddenly woohoo everything is great escrow services like if you can cut that out then you suddenly save a ton of fees also Who's doing that right right now? I actually don't think there are many Web3 companies that are, like, Web3 isn't popular yet because everyone is trying to take this, like, very Web3 approach that Web2 users don't understand. For example, like, in the creator economy, a lot of people are doing social tokens and, like, you can buy your favorite creator's tokens and stake them, et cetera. And, like, people are like, I don't understand what that means. Right. And it's hard. you got to yeah. set all these accounts up and yep. it's not easy, yep. right? Yeah. Like, I think who's doing it right would be actually like probably pretty big brands like Dolce & Gabbana just launched an NFT, but this NFT is tied to utility. Mm -hmm. So like they are throwing parties around the world. You get invited to their exclusive fashion shows. They have like vacation trips to take you on. You get exclusive merchandise because you own this NFT. So like for a lot of people, that's like easy to understand. Um, I think Royal is really interesting. So they're like a music NFT platform where like artists can sell a percentage of their songs and then their fans can earn royalties on it, which also makes sense because like, okay, like if you're, you're betting on the artist essentially, right? Does, um, does that tap into like ASCAP and BMI and all those royalty organizations? Do they connect those? I believe so, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. And then I would say like even the monkeys, like Board Ape Yacht Club is doing it right in the sense that they are throwing parties around the world and having big performers like Snoop Dogg. I personally had friends that really wanted to go to a Board Ape party during NFT week and like buy an ape yeah. that cost $200,000 right. just to go to this party. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. But they kind of hold their value, right? So. Yeah, yeah. I like view it as like a more expensive Soho house. <laughs> That's funny. What about the kind of the crash in crypto right now? What do you, what, what do you see happening with that? Is that going to... I think crypto down. is always cyclical. Like, I think it's going to go back up eventually because there is a lot of, like, reasons why Web3 and blockchain technologies are useful. You have a new venture yes. that I think you started in April. And I was a little confused because I saw Moment some places and I saw Passes some places. Yeah. So, basically, um, there's another company called Moment and they own the trademark. So, we were forced to rebrand. Okay. But I like Passes because it immediately tells you the utility and you don't think about it as NFTs. And we're taking an approach of like not even mentioning NFTs on the platform because I think that like a lot of people are turned off by the idea because there's so many people that did projects that were essentially rug pulls. Like they launched an art piece, they sold it, and then they disappeared. And it's just like a random piece of art that you can do nothing with that's not even like a nice piece of art. Right. So for us, we're like, okay, let's tie it to utility. Like it's going to give you merchandise access, live events, digital membership to exclusive content, and just call it like fan club memberships. And that's something that like everyone can easily grasp. And we just have all the benefits of Web3 without like people knowing it's Web3. I joined the wait list, but, but there's not a lot about yeah. it. Can you tell us like, like what is it if you were, I mean, if you're pitching that, if these are your investors and you're pitching passes. Yeah. 
So essentially, like, it's just a paid exclusive membership club. So let's say I am like Miley Cyrus. Um, someone can buy my NFT, which is essentially a pass. And, and get you have to have it pre-created or does it mint there or how, how does that work? So it mints on the site. So you just press a button and we'll mint one. Different membership tiers and depending on what membership tier you have, you get different access to different perks. So on the baseline, let's say exclusive content. So behind the scenes footage, et cetera, um, you can message me and DM me and if you want to like tip me in crypto you can or in dollars but it's beneficial to tip in crypto because like let's say i had a super fan right and they really wanted to get to me they could tip a million dollars and then i'll notice them and then the cool thing about nfts is that it's interoperable so I w if i wanted to offer like a meet and greet i can use another website like ticket fairy token proof and instead of a meet and greet specifically for my nft holders i can do merch drops specifically for them and the great thing is i get like way more data on my fans like let's say these passes were tied to tickets to my concert. Traditionally, if a person were buying a ticket to every single one of my concert, I might think they're a super fan, but I wouldn't actually know if they attended or not because they could be reselling the tickets and scalping. Mm. Now, if they're like selling the passes, I know exactly who they're selling it to and I know they're a ticket scalper. But on top of that, like normally Ticketmaster would take the fees, right? I could set a 10% royalty fee on my passes. So every time it transferred, now it's not Ticketmaster taking the fees, I'm getting the money back. So that's a lot more money for me. What's also cool is I can see like every other thing that's happening in their wallet so i can see like okay they have a bunch of elenium nfts so like for whatever reason my fans are also elenium fans so i can do a collab with elenium ah. or wow they're spending a lot of money on this like one eyelash brand i should create my own eyelash brand makes everything super transparent and this is data that like they just didn't have before like if you were designing if you were consulting with someone about designing the ideal nft what would you advise them to do in terms of utility and smart contracts and all that kind of stuff? In terms of utility, I think they should definitely tie it to in real life events somehow because I think so that's in person events. Yeah, I think that's easier to swallow mm -hmm. um, because people are willing to already pay for tickets to in person events. I think sites like Patreon, OnlyFans, etc., are making it make more sense to tie it to a digital digital membership as well. But like, if you can have both, that's awesome, right? I would also just say merchandise drops, board ape yacht club merchandise drops just sell out instantly, and like you have a skip that like you could have bought on a merch shop for a hundred dollars that's now selling for thousands of dollars and people are still buying it right there's just like an indefinite amount of things you can do like i would probably tie it to like maybe a lifetime discount to something so then it holds value for life as well so it's like okay you own this nft like you get like 50 percent off mcdonald's for life if okay. you're like a big mcdonald's fan like that nft is going to resell for a ton um, i think Achella actually did a really good job of this where they sold nfts that gave you like essentially lifetime artist guest passes and now those nfts are going for a million dollars or so and every time it resells coachella is probably getting like 100 200k kickback so they're like making money indefinitely for it and the crazy thing is it was priced at the point where you could buy artist guest passes for life and it wouldn't add up to the cost of nft but i think that like people like the flex they like the art and like it's just an easier concept to swallow in their head like oh i get lifetime passes and to them also like maybe they'll even make money on the nft by reselling it as it gains value in the future right so like right. then the total cost is either zero dollars or profitable to them which is actually already happened with the people who have resold it meanwhile coachella is just making tons of money from like the initial sale and the royalty fees the only thing i'm concerned about there is so like you sell it now you're getting paid as they resell yeah um but what happens when you're fully at capacity let's say that we did it for an event here so we have only so many seats that we can do when we have sold the full amount of seats. Now other people are selling that and we're making money off the resales, but we can't really issue any new things because we're out of capacity. But you're not issuing new seats because when they resell it, they're giving up their seats. So, right, so, but yeah. that's it, right? You just, you, you kind of say, okay, when I'm calculating, what is this going to be worth? Is this a good thing to do? Yeah. You need to think about, okay, well, I've, I can sell this many. And obviously yeah. you can sell as many board apes, I guess, as you want, right? Yeah. Is it good for places that would have physical limitations like that? Or? No, so like what, what you would do for this is, let's say there's like 5,000 seats, right? You just sell 5,000 NFTs and if they resell, then you're getting all the royalty fees and ticket resales, but like you still only have 5,000 tickets, right. right? So like 5,000 passes and it's only going to this 5,000 people. Right. What I would do though, 
personally would be like have like some VIP access. So it's like a hundred is the VIP and like right. they get different perks and that's super limited. Or just like offer some NFTs that get you like first rights to access. Like imagine if you had an NFT that like for life you got to buy tickets to Burning Man. Like you got first access to Burning Man. People get stressed about Burning Man right. and Coachella. Like they would pay just to even be able to like have first access to buy right. the normal pass. Right. <laughs> Who would you say are the competitors to passes? I, I would say the closest competitors right now are actually Web2 platforms. So it'd be like Patreon, OnlyFans, etc. Ticketmaster? Ticketmaster, yes. But we're not totally focused on ticketing. Yeah. Like at the moment, we'd rather them plug into other websites like Ticket Barrier Token Proof to handle ticketing. Because yeah. NFTs are interoperable, which is interesting. Like uh, they could take the NFT and like take it to any other platform they want. Like for now, we just want to focus on the like exclusive digital content and we'll help creators plug into the right platforms to offer merch drops, to offer like ticketing, et cetera. How do you keep track of such a changing world, everything in, yeah. in Web3? What do you read, consume, watch, listen to? that helps you stay on top of things? Uh, honestly, I'm the type of person that just clicks random links. I think Twitter and like listening to the smartest people is awesome. Um, who who are some of those people you think? I, Vitalik is awesome. Um, I really like, I have Multicoin, my lead investors, they're like on top of things. You have A16Z, who I think is like one of the best crypto funds out there. So like Chris Dixon, Jane Lippincott. On the consumer side, like thinking about consumer, Alfred Lin is like a legend. <gasps> There's just so many. And, and I'm in these communities, right? So yeah. I do go to these tech events and meet people and talk to people. Like crash random DAOs in New York and talk to people in there too. Nice, okay. In your new company, you took some funding from, was it anti Anti fund? Yeah, so Jake Paul's fund anti fund. Yeah, invested. Logan was here last yep, night. Yep, I saw. I think this will be good for people to hear. Why would you go out and take money from somebody else versus funding yourself in something like that? Because it's a, it's eight million dollars. It's not a ton of money. It's not you know it's not nothing. But yeah. So initially I was planning on self funding, but I realized people were willing to invest at like any valuation I named. So I ended <laughs> up saying I wanted to raise it a fifty million dollar valuation, and it worked out. But I would say. I would took money from people in the end because I realized how useful people could be just in terms of introductions, et cetera. Like they're very incentive aligned to help the company grow, right? Mm -hmm. Versus if I funded it myself, like yes, I would own 100%, but I wouldn't get the outside help. And I've gotten a lot of like helpful intros from my investors. Yeah, I guess just a as a last question, is there anything that you think that you could share with us here. We're, we're a bunch of intermediate to advanced marketers looking at Web3 versus other kinds of marketing, and you've built tools for us. I bet some of yeah. us have bought your, uh, your Twitter follow, unfollow, and things like that back in the day. But is there anything that you would share as far as just kind of looking forward into the future that we might be thinking about in terms of resources, in terms of direction, in terms of focus, anything like that? Yeah, well, I think for marketers especially, like what's really interesting is you can hyper-target people. So let's say you want to target like all music fans for whatever reason, you can literally Google or essentially Google like who owns like these music NFTs and then you can airdrop something into their wallets. And I check my wallet all the time for like yeah. random things that get airdropped in. And people will literally like just see like, oh, I have this like random, I don't know, like water bottle NFT. Let me like click it. And then like it has a link to your website. Nice. And suddenly you get like direct exposure to people that they're forced to look at. You can like essentially Google for anything. Like you can look up like high net worth individuals, like people who have like shopped at a certain place, et cetera. So it's like really hyper targeted marketing that I think is like probably better than spending on ads personally, nice. especially as like Ethereum 2.0 comes out, the gas fee should be a lot cheaper, but also on other chains like Solana. Like let's say I want to target like fine art, like Thank You X has like a lot of NFTs on Solana and I could just like find wallets that have it and like drop in like my art fair. NFTs. I don't know. That's great. Um, That's actually yeah. really, really cool. Yep. And are there any tools to help automate that or anything like that? I mean, if you look up just like NFT wallet finders, I'm sure you'll find something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come and share with us. Let's give her a big hand. <laughs> thank you very much.